PR Pro Cannabis Media. When it comes to the cannabis business, Canadian Bruce Linton has seen it all from his garage to the boardroom, from his entrepreneurial days to building Canopy Growth into the world's largest cannabis corporation. Now he's on In the Weeds with Jimmy Young next. Don't look now, but it's a whole new world of weed out there. Pot is flower, it's Bruce Banner and Blue Dream. You've got bongs and dabs, resin and shatter, vaping and edibles, new terms, new strains, and new ways to use cannabis sativa, the plant. Some just made with CBD, and hemp has minimal THC. There's sativa and indica strains, and 100 chemicals, all legal in 10 states for adult use. There's a lot to get to know. Get used to it, folks, because it's legal in the Bay State and it's not going away. Neither is In the Weeds with Jimmy Young next. Revolutionary Clinics is just one of 49 medical cannabis dispensaries in Massachusetts, but there's a reason why it's one of the most popular. It's their patient-first philosophy. All day long, they teach, they educate, they communicate about this complicated plant called cannabis sativa. That's true. Whether you visit their Cambridge location in Fresh Pond at 110 Fawcett Street or at 67 Broadway in Somerville. Revolutionary Clinics, where the patient comes first. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a continuing edition of In the Weeds in Jamaica with Jimmy Young for Pro Cannabis Media. And joining me now is someone that needs no introduction to the cannabis world. His name is Bruce Linton. Everybody loves you, man. It's uh, I didn't see it coming, frankly. Um, <laughs> you know, who would have thought like uh, this fella from Ottawa, Canada, uh, would actually have some impact and clout on Jamaican uh, cannabis. But I think what I've been advocating for is ways that uh, the disenfranchised, the originals, have a defined guaranteed market. And so it uh, became a pretty popular topic to start a public policy debate about why can't you guarantee 25% of all dispensary sales to indigenous producers and then have them get 50% of the net profit uh, shared with the processor. So the way coffee works here is a whole bunch of people grow coffee and they get provided inputs and then the coffee gets picked up and brought to a centralized processing plant and when it's processed there the people who grew it make a carry on the difference between the inputs and the total volume of coffee I'd like to even do it better and I think um, it's just a slight twist on the already known model for coffee eventually this herb is going to be traded as a commodity worldwide you see that day uh, it's okay if you don't agree no, I, I think I think it'll be traded where um, price matters, but I think it's also going to be traded where uh, how was it produced, who did it help or hurt. Um, I think it's going to be more likely traded as an API sometime in the future when we figure out what we want to do with them than just bulk. So it, um, to me, I think what the opportunity in Jamaica is, own it. Really fulfill the brand expectation, make phenomenal products, have a story of a whole island coming healthy because of it. And that's an economic thing that becomes a social thing. And so I think Jamaica has a chance to be materially different than any other place on the planet. It already is because it's ingrained in the culture, it's ingrained in its history. And I know you and I sat in on the same uh, workshop, breakout room, uh, listening to the farmers plea and to hear their frustrations. I know you were deeply moved by that too. Well, I was, but the, their problem isn't gonna be the right to grow it is if you have the right to grow it and you don't have a well-structured market to take the product, then you choke on inventory. And when you're choking on inventory, you might actually start spending, sending your money to the illicit market and now the thing unravels. So like that, that workshop, um, it, it really made me realize that what they have to do is guarantee on a five-year trial, the thing I just described related to coffee for cannabis and that the 14 parishes each get uh, their proportionality of the total 25% market share and you start actually having genetic markers and you start making sure like like if it says it came from Portland it came from Portland and I think if we get that right um, people will prefer to come to Jamaica for the product they'll prefer to buy product from Jamaica because of its inclusion and isn't that what the plants all about too inclusion isn't that one that was his message one people one love one humanity it's just like the plant it really they really do believe in this and it's part of their souls here well, and I'm being uh, interviewed by someone from the U.S., so we'll probably be poorly received, but I keep saying that, like, in some ways, um, 
entrepreneurs in the cannabis space have to be socialists that drive Jaguars. And what that means is that we all want to make a lot of money and do very well for ourselves, but we're unwilling to leave others behind. And if we do it that way, the effect will be that um, we're wildly more appreciated and supported because we are inclusive rather than exclusive. They're certainly trying to do that in Massachusetts too with their social equity initiative, but they're having issues with that because it's the first year of the industry. And as you know, oh look, here comes a drink now. The little flag was up. Uh, rum punch. Uh, I love rum punch, and by the way, you just can't get good help around here. You know what I'm saying? They, they scrape in the bottom of the barrel with Mr. Kirk. Rum not punch. Yes, Definitely rum not punch. <laughs> with your rum, that's right. Um, Bruce, can you? Uh, t we all know what you did. Yeah. Take me where you're going, because I know you. Over the last month or so, you've gotten yourself involved with a couple of new ventures. Can you walk me through a few of them in a short period of time? Because I know elevator pitches is, is a challenge. Well, it's kind of funny. I feel like what I've done is invested, so I got part-time jobs. And so the part-time jobs mean that I get more equity than I paid for, but I got to do work. And so what I did is I looked at hallucinogenics through uh, my medicine. I looked at single state through Gage, Michigan. I looked at multi-state for one I'll have to announce on Wednesday. I looked at um, how do we do things like brands, so I got slang going. DNA are my guys on uh, Authentic Grow, so I want to see that come through. And You're a human vertical in this space, you know that. But, but I need it because if I, if I don't have uh, the better dog food company, I can't actually have researchers attracted to what I want to work on and work on how do we deal with all kinds of mammals. And so like, I want to be able to work on the things I want to work on with teams, and so you need to be in a company to do that. And then the final thing I'll probably do is um, there's a really smart venture group out of uh, Paris and other parts of Europe where I want to invest as a limited partner because I think the deep 3.0, 4.0 researchers might in fact have an easier time of it in Europe where there's a very stabilized platform with great academic institutions. Take, if you have, I'd love to hear your journey with Canopy Growth. Started as a startup, someone who is an entrepreneur, had an idea, started it, and you took it up you built into some of the biggest um, transactions uh, with, with other companies like Constellation and then eventually Acreage Holdings. And then, of course, you know, they decided to go in another direction. You've seen it all from the very beginning to the end of your personal involvement, a little bit anyway, on the, on the front side as the CEO. Walk me through the different emotional roller coaster that had to be like as you're going on that. Um, so there was really not any stress because for the most part, stress is when there's no interest in what you're doing and there's no money. So what was mainly was excitement. And um, it was a place where you could attract really great people, increasingly so every day because it became more and more evident it was a legitimate one. So it was a very positive environment because they're really good people. And I would say that people who like doing startups should try six or seven, I have. And then you don't like startups. It's much easier to get stuff done when there's 100 people or 1,000 people in the company than when there's 10. And so, like, I really enjoyed um, operating with 4,500 people because it meant that if you encountered an opportunity to contemplate what about this in Greece, you had feet on the street, you could actually get right into the discussion. They could go see the key officials and be back to you within a day on whether or not that was a good angle or not. And so um, I can't recreate that access, but that was very enjoyable to have because it meant that you were frontline in conversations with, you know, like I had a breakfast where I got to attend with a few other companies um, I don't know what it would be, three, four months ago, with the head of the NHS, which is the British head of their health authority, and an elected official, that conversation over the course of an hour is extremely helpful. Uh, you want to be able to be there. And so um, that was probably the biggest reward of having a big company is that you could actually be in the originating conversations. You're part of history, Bruce. You've carved yourself a nice little niche, and uh, I, I am honored that uh, we've actually had an opportunity to talk. And I guess we have to give credit to this guy, Kurt Dalton, over here from Cannabis.net, who's about to bring my, my headdress on. Okay, I'm certainly, I'm certainly, thanks a lot, Kurt. Um, can you keep a straight face and look at me at this time? It is a different look, but um, you know what I found when I'm here is um, everybody that's been at this conference really is. Um, they're trying to find a way to be involved and not on the next day or week, but for the next 10 years. And so um, there's been all kinds of characters here. And, and I found that um, I didn't meet anybody who was here that wasn't genuine trying to find a path for Jamaica. And so, you know what, you're doing the same thing. You may be culturally appropriating somebody's stuff, appropriate or not, but you... Um, I paid American dollars for this. I, I think you, you guys are the pro-cannabis story. 
And what's happening here is it's a very pro-cannabis crowd. Can you believe at my session this morning, we had the High Commissioner for Canada and we had a very senior equivalent official for Jamaica on a Saturday morning at 9.30 a.m. to turn up and talk about what does, what's needed to create this next generation. So it's been a good trip. That's Bruce Linton, and he is truly a legend in the cannabis industry. I want to thank uh, Kurt Dalton for providing us with a little bit about Dalton. I've noticed he brought you a drink and didn't bring it to me. I, I just want to say it's our... I appreciate it, Kurt Dalton from Cannabis.net. So for Bruce, I'm Jimmy Young. Remember, folks, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. Revolutionary Clinics is just one of 49 medical cannabis dispensaries in Massachusetts, but there's a reason why it's one of the most popular. It's their patient-first philosophy. All day long, they teach, they educate, they communicate about this complicated plant called Cannabis Sativa. That's true. Whether you visit their Cambridge location in Fresh Pond at 110 Fawcett Street or at 67 Broadway in Somerville. Revolutionary Clinics, where the patient comes first. In the Weeds with Jimmy Young is a production of the Pro Cannabis Media Group for the education and information of our listening audience. The opinions on this podcast are strictly those of the hosts of the program and do not represent Pro Cannabis Media or any of its affiliates. No medical advice is given and any use of cannabis should be by adults over the age of 21 and used responsibly.